This evening's discourse is on deepening our inner life. And yesterday when I learned the title of the topic that was uh, we were going to be talking about today, it reminded me of something I had seen on the internet a few days ago. Maybe some of you have seen it also. It was quite interesting. Uh, I was uh, looking at the news and I noticed this little article there. And uh, apparently there was a little boy who was playing in his, uh, before his house and up behind him came a dog and the dog bit the little boy on the back of the leg. And the little boy was in pain and was crying and fell on the pavement. And the, the dog was about to, looked as if the dog was about to attack the boy again. And just at that moment, from out of the side of the picture came running the cat to the house, the house cat, came running, jumped on the back of the dog uh, and uh, scared the dog. The dog ran away. And last, one of the last images is of the dog running and the cat chasing the dog away. And it was very interesting because normally, of course, you don't see cats do that. Dogs maybe, but not so much cats. And it made me think about when I heard this topic, deepening your inner life, it made me wonder, I wondered, we have an inner life if, or perhaps the first question to ask ourselves is, do we have an inner life? And I began to think about that because as I was watching those animals, I was questioning, do they have an inner life? What are they thinking? Do they have, how are they different than us? What separates animals from humans? And are, as humans, as, as we assume that we have an inner life, and I was wondering, do those animals have an inner life? I, if we look at ourselves, then what characterizes us as humans is we have an ego, Animals don't have much of an ego. It's in latent form. It's, it's not a developed ego, certainly. But yet they must have some sense of, of identity. Obviously that cat was attached very much so to its owner and was springing to the rescue to save it from being attacked by that dog. But what is it that makes us human? I was thinking about this and it seems that we have as humans, we have the power of intuition and we have an intuitive awareness of a sense of I exist, I am. And I think we could perhaps say that when we speak to this topic of deepening our inner life, what we're really speaking about is deepening our inner sense of awareness expanding our awareness. We often hear this term used. I have, a, I have a sense of an expanded awareness. And I think this is something that all of us, when we take up the spiritual life, this is what one of our intentions is, to expand that sense of awareness, to deepen our awareness. I think all of you are aware, or perhaps have heard of, the concept of yugas. The cycles of time in which mankind, this universe or this solar system that we are in, passes through in ages that ascend and then ages that descend. And this was uh, extensively or more extensively explained by Paramahansa Yogananda's guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, saying that uh, that waves of energy from the center of the galaxy flood the solar system and at such times mankind when we're when greater energy floods the solar system mankind's consciousness is elevated and when we're further away from that solar galactic center mankind's sense of consciousness sense of awareness descends now one of the character what are what is it in this passage of time, this rising and falling of cycles, what characterizes the differences between the yugas? The one of the first things that comes to mind that when they think of this is people say, well, we must be in a high age now because we're look at all the wonderful technology that we had. We look back in time and the technology wasn't so developed, so we must be in a high age. But the masters, that's not what they say. It's not defined by technology, it's defined 
my awareness. The higher the awareness, the higher the level of the yuga that we find ourselves in. And actually, the masters say that we are not in a particularly high age. We're not in the lowest of Kali Yuga. Uh, we have, as Sri Teshwar explained, we've come out of Kali Yuga, but yet we're only beginning in that next Yuga, that Dwapara Yuga that uh, follows Kali Yuga. And one of the characteristics of Kali Yuga, a primary characteristic of Kali Yuga, is that awareness is dim. And our awareness we seem to think, our awareness being dim, we perceive this world only in terms of material matter. And we, we perceive it through the senses, and we believe that everything in this universe, the basic reality of this universe, is matter. And the concept that there is something more subtle beyond that is not, it does not occur to people, because here it's very solid, we can see it, this is what exists, and this is the nature of this universe, is this material substance that is perceived by our senses. Well, we know now, and science tells us, that matter is not the ultimate reality, and this is one of the indications that Sri Yukteswar explained one of the indications that we've come out of Kali Yuga, but we have not come far because we look back, it's only within the last hundred years, a little more than that, that we've come to the understanding that this material universe is not matter, that its energy is behind this matter. And this is beginning of Dwapara Yuga. One of the characteristic traits of Dwapara Yuga is we begin to question this assumption that this world is only matter, and we begin to explore what is it that's behind matter, and we begin to, uh, as science has explained to us already, we begin to see that there's energy behind this matter, and, and as this yuga proceeds, subtler and subtler realms of that energy will be discovered, and we begin to become aware of it. Our awareness begins to expand because we are, as a solar system, we're being flooded with larger influences of energy of in some subtle form. Our consciousness is being raised by the very environment in which we are in. Now, this uh, raises a certain principle, or brings up a certain principle when we come to the topic of how do we deepen our inner life? And if we're asking that question, and we can rephrase it, how do we deepen or expand our awareness? Well, one of them, just by the principle of the yugas, is I think the first principle would be we must recognize that we are influenced. Cosmically, in terms of the yugas, we're influenced, but these are very large. Uh, we have no choice about that, you might say. We're, we're on this earth, whether we choose to be or not choose to be. Our karma has brought us here, but we're being influenced. And in time, of course, we will as a society. Uh, our awareness will be increased. But the principle behind that is we can be influenced by things outside of ourselves. And if we are wise, we can use that principle to deepen our own sense of awareness, deepen our inner life. Why do you go on pilgrimage? Why do we, why do we seek out the company of saints? Why do we surround ourselves with holy objects and, and perhaps put uh, holy objects on our altar? It's because we realize that pilgrimages, holy places, holy uh, personages even more so, that these have an influence and we put, them, we put ourselves into their presence and we begin to feel uplifted. And we can use this principle uh, to our benefit. And I think this is uh, the mark of a person who begins to, begins to be attracted to the spiritual life is they begin to realize that, yes, I need to be wise in the choice of my friends, I need to be wise in the choice of who I associate with, and they begin to even fix their physical surroundings in such a way that it's God reminding. And, of course, this is also the principle of satsang. We, we come together 
even you know, even if it's through the internet, we're coming together to have satsang so that we might be influenced. And this principle can be put to use for us. Now, uh, there was a uh, story of Swami Paramahansa Yogananda. It's not enough. Sim we have to we begin by choosing our environment, but it's not enough just to put ourselves into an environment only that, just physically. It will have an effect, but something more is needed. Paramahansa Yogananda said about his ashram uh, on Mount Washington there in Los Angeles, he said, there are many rats and mice who live on this mountain, but they're not making spiritual progress just of, in themselves, just by being on that mountain where the ashram was. We have to be, uh, we have to have the power to receive those blessings. In other words, we have a part to play. Just being in a, in a spiritual environment can be very beneficial, but the ability to receive those blessings is up to us. We have to be open. We have to put ourselves in, in a frame of mind, in a frame of heart, to be able to be influenced and blessed. As uh, Paramahansa Yogananda would say, God's blessings is, are there. The Guru's blessings are there. It is your blessings that are lacking. And so we have to add our blessings to that. I remember the very first time I, not the first time, maybe the second or third time, I, I visited uh, the one of Paramahansa Yogananda's shrines in Los Angeles. It's called the Lake Shrine. Very beautiful place. But I went there with a few friends and I went there and I went in the gate and I immediately felt these, this tremendous blessing of some sort. I was not uh, on the spiritual path at that time consciously, but nevertheless, even though I wasn't aware of what I was feeling, I did recognize that I felt something holy there. And I enjoyed it very much. I sat very quietly. It was before I began to meditate. I just sat quietly and enjoyed that. But interestingly, I was there with three, four or five friends, and they felt nothing. They felt absolutely nothing. They just, you, you might say, they joked and laughed and, and uh, were very sarcastic and cynical about the whole environment there. And, they, and uh, I was struck by why didn't they feel something? I felt something. They didn't. I read the autobiography of a yogi for the first time. I was tremendously moved, inspired, changed my life. It's brought me to the point where I am now in the spiritual life. I gave it to my best friend. He read, a few, he read about half the book and he put it aside. He said, well, that's nice, but he was not interested. So you see, the, the environment alone is not enough. We have to be open, perhaps karmically, the time has to be right, but also we have to be eager or willing to draw the influence of our environment to be able to uh, deepen our spiritual life. In this case, in those cases, I wasn't trying. It influenced me without my trying, but I had a certain openness to it. But once we begin to progress and we want to consciously use this principle, we have to apply ourselves. We have to attune ourselves, put ourselves in alignment with the blessings that are coming to us. And this is, the, this. many people go to the Guru and look for inspiration. Many people go and look, look for change in their life and the Guru blesses all. But some are able to receive that blessing and some are not. You might say, beyond willing, we also have to want to receive those blessings. You could say, if we want to deepen our inner life, that may mean that something within us needs to change. Oftentimes, people, they want blessings, but they're not willing or do, are willing to make the sacrifices necessary to allow those blessings to come into them because it may be there's something blocking those blessings come. So they have to, you have to be willing to change. And many centuries ago, there was a very famous theologian uh, in the uh, Catholic Church. His name was St. Augustine. And St. Augustine, he lived at about uh, 400, 500 uh, years after Christ. And 
he was a great man, very, very great man, but earlier in his life he prayed to God, said, Lord, Lord, make me a saint, but not yet. <laughs> and I think that pretty much sums it up. We want, we want to change. We want to meditate more deeply. We want to deepen our spiritual life. But when it comes to the point of actually doing something about it, not yet. Oftentimes people will be very devotionally uplifted. I've been to many kirtans, I've been to many satsangs where people are very uplifted and they just felt, oh, it was wonderful, I feel my heart is open. And you never see them the next morning when it comes to meditate for sadhana. Where are they? They're sleeping in bed. We have to be willing to put the energy out to make use of the environment, make use of the blessings that come to us. So if we want to, if we want to deepen our inner life, we have to have enthusiasm for deepening our inner life. Swami Kriyananda defined enthusiasm as the uh, spirit of joy directed by the will. That's close to what he said. I can't remember the exact quote. The spirit of joy directed by the will. So we have to be joyful, but then we have to use the will, and then with that enthusiasm, then we can deepen the spiritual life, deepen our inner life. And in the deepening of that inner life, our awareness begins to expand. Now, what happens when you feel that enthusiasm for God? You feel, you feel uplifted, don't you? You feel a sense of inspiration. Whenever you feel inspired, there's an upward movement of life force. Many of you who have taken our classes, you know that we explained this. There's this upward movement of life force. Whenever there's an upward movement of life force, our awareness, our sense of self has increased. It's become larger. We, in a sense, we embrace more. Whenever there's a downward flow of life force, you might say a depression of energy or a, 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 a diminishing, there is a contraction and our world has become smaller. Whatever we do in life, if we want to deepen our inner life, we want to deepen and expand our awareness. Whatever we can do to expand our sense of, our, of, of the true self, not the ego self, but our sense of true self, this, that, this sense of sympathy for the world, the sense of sympathy for others, whatever we can do to increase that, our awareness will increase, just naturally. So, so uh, energy, a sense of enthusiasm, a sense of positiveness, anything that causes this upward flow will naturally be something that will deepen our inner life because our awareness will increase. So, I've mentioned one principle, this is the first principle you could say, of deepening our inner life. Our environment is stronger than willpower and arrange your environment because we are influenced in, in, and arrange it in such a way that it, it, it uh, facilitates this sense of deepening, this sense of expansion. The second principle that, or, or tool, let's say, to deepen your awareness is something that's very appropriate for this age. I mentioned the yugas. I mentioned that uh, in this age of, of Dwapar that we're moving into, what one of the characteristics is, is that we're uh, becoming aware that this world is not as of matter, is not what it seems. There's something deeper there. Now, there's a, there's a sloka in the Bhagavad Gita that you'll, you may remember. It says that uh, day for the worldly man is night for the yogi. Whereas day for the yogi is night for the worldly man. And this is how it is. The worldly men, or you say the, the person who 
is steeped in the consciousness of Kali Yuga, looks at the world and say, this is the reality, there's nothing more. And of course, this is a very common uh, outlook in the world today, that this is this world, this, uh, this world of matter is the end all and be all of everything. But in Dwapara Yuga, this will change. We'll begin to have a consciousness that there is something inside, there is something deeper beyond this physical, material world. And Paramahansa Yogananda and the gurus of our path came for a very specific reason at this time. Uh, Swami Kriyananda is often characterized, Yoganandaji, as the guru of Dwapara Yuga. He came and the masters came to usher in techniques to be able to allow us to explore this inner life. To speak of it is fine, but if we don't have a means by which we can actually explore for ourselves, it's incomplete. And so one of Yogananda's missions in coming to the West and coming to the West and ultimately to spread these teachings out into the world was to give mankind in this age, at the beginning of this Dwapara Yuga, tools by which we could actually begin to explore that inner kingdom and to be able to develop and deepen our inner life. And so we practice Kriya Yoga with, uh, as is, one, is the primary science that Yoganandaji brought out into the world, we practice Kriya Yoga with the specific intention the specific purpose of deepening our inner life, to give us an awareness through our personal experience of something beyond this outer world of the senses. We speak of it, but until we actually have an inner experience, it doesn't become real to us. But once we have that inner experience, nothing can convince you otherwise after you have had a personal experience for yourself. I, years, uh, a few years ago, some years ago, I visited in America the Grand Canyon. And I'd heard about the Grand Canyon as a very large uh, canyon with a river at the bottom. But until I actually went to the rim of that canyon and looked out into it, I really didn't grasp the vastness of how big that formation actually is. And then after that, nothing could convince me otherwise, because I knew I had seen for myself what the Grand Canyon was like. And so it is with us. If, we, if Kriya is the tool that has been given to us in this age to be able to direct our consciousness away from the outer world into the inner world. Now, in, you might say in, in a little bit yogic, deeper terms, what is happening in Kriya is that we're learning to direct our consciousness into the deep spine of the Shushumna. And this is what will characterize Dwapara Yuga in the centuries ahead. It seems far-fetched now when we think into the future that this will be common. This will be a common feature uh, of this age. But it's true. This is what Sri Yukteswar prophesizes in his book, The Holy Science. Kriya Yoga is the science of this age because it will give us that experience. So if you want to deepen your inner life, practice the techniques that you've been given and uh, look for those, uh, try to feel those experiences and have those experiences of the interiorization of the consciousness. Begin to listen to the Om begin to see the light of the spiritual eye and this will begin to draw you ever more deeply into your inner self, into that inner kingdom. The third, I'd like to mention one third principle of how to deepen your inner life. The, uh, if you read the, uh, I was just recently uh, a couple of weeks ago in preparation for another class, I was rereading Sri Yukteswar's book, The Holy Science. And he makes a very uh, pointed statement in that book. He says, 
the principal requisite of a holy life is to develop the natural love of the heart. Now, this is, uh, this is, you might say, the beginning of the spiritual life, to be able to develop the natural love of the heart. So when we speak about deepening our spiritual life, or when we speak about deepening our awareness, deepening our inner life, how can we develop that heart's love? What is it? What do we need to do to purify that heart? He says, to develop, uh, to develop that love, we need to first purify it. And then he goes on to say that the heart is, uh, is typically darkened by what he called the meannesses of the heart. Hatred, grief, fear, shame, race prejudice, pride of pedigree, a narrow sense of respectability, condemnation, these sorts of things, they cloud the heart. They make it, they, it's, it, they make it mean. Now in the English language, mean, meannesses of the heart has more than one, mean has more than one uh, meaning. It means, uh, uh, some, when we say a person is mean, we, that implies that they're unkind. So yes, it could be, we can think of it as unkindnesses of the heart, but also mean means small. So when we talk about meannesses, it's those things that make the heart small. Now, remember earlier when, when I said that whenever we feel a sense of expansion, we, whenever we feel a sense of, of upliftment, there's a sense of growth, of being larger. And whenever we feel larger, there's a, there's a deepening of our intuition, our, our deepening of our awareness takes place. Whenever we feel small, a sense of suffering comes to us. Now, we begin with the heart. Whenever there's something that makes our heart small, whenever it constricts the heart, it's the opposite. It, of, of what we're trying to achieve in life. We want to expand that sense of self. And to do this, we need to open up and begin with the heart. This is uh, the beginning of the spiritual life. Swami Sri Yukteswar, who was himself a great jnana yogi, and one not noted for his bhakti sense, uh, uh, it was he, he made this very startling statement in that book, not startling so much, but not seemingly uncharacteristic. He said, one cannot take even the first step on the spiritual path without this development of the heart's natural love. And so this is where we have to begin. But we don't only just begin there, we have to then take it step by step by step to continue to deepen that quality of developing the heart's natural love. It's something that is the companion of the spiritual life for the devotee. Now, Sri Teshvar also goes on in that uh, holy scripture, the, the holy science, he goes on to say, the way to, the practical way to purify that heart, yes, we we, we chant, and yes, we do devotions, we do these types of things. But he said what uh, is perhaps more necessary, he says, is the development of the yamas and the niyamas. Through the development of the yama and niyama principles, the heart becomes purified. I mention that because oftentimes people don't associate those two. What is the purpose of yamas and niyamas is to lead a right, righteous life, to behave properly, to make the proper foundation for our spiritual life. But he says also it's the development of the overcoming of these uh, meannesses of the heart. Think for example, hatred. I mentioned it's a meanness of the heart. And of course when we look into the uh, one of the yamas, Ahimsa, the nonviolence, hatred and nonviolence, we can see are the opposites of each other. So, in the development of Ahimsa, we we naturally begin to dissolve and loosen uh, the the chains that bind the heart 
in hatred. So consequently, practice of that begins to, uh, uh, to overcome and to uh, that, the, that particular meanness. If you look at each of those meannesses of the heart, you can see in some fashion hatred, fear, prejudice, pride, all of them have an element of ego separation. If I hate somebody, I've established a, a barrier between that person and myself. If I'm prejudiced toward another person for, for some external reason, you know, of their heritage or their race, whatever it might be, I see myself as different from that person. Condemnation, again, I'm each of these qualities of, of meannesses of the heart have as this element of a separation of me from the other person. So Sri Teshvar characterized them as eight, but really there is many as the qualities that exist that separate one person from another. And in that separation, our heart becomes small and unable to love. And without that love of the heart, we're not able to dive deep into meditation. We're not able to dive deep into uh, the necessary things that we must do in the spiritual life in order to make progress. I mentioned earlier, a person sometimes will, the person who perhaps shows up, uh, participates in the kirtan, is very uplifted, joyful, has uh, so much love for God, and then the next morning is not able to show up for meditation, not able to go deeper into, into the spiritual practices. The heart has not been developed enough. Why, is that, why do I say that? Because if you love something, you'll want to get up in the morning to pursue it. If you if, think of the lover, the lover and the beloved, a lover thinks only of the beloved, can't take its mind off the beloved, distracted by the beloved. This is the state that we want to have. When uh, the desire, that desire for a deepening of our relationship with God is there, our desire to, to embrace life and to feel that inner kingdom and to experience that inner kingdom, when that desire is there enthusiastically within us, we want to get up in the morning. We want to go. We want to do whatever we can uh, to further that. And that reality becomes uh, our reality. And the worldly pursuits, yes, we have our duties to do, but we do those to the degree that we can uh, fit them into our other, uh, our, the rest of our daily life. Oftentimes when we're teaching meditation to people, people will come afterwards and they'll ask the question, they say, well, I'm such a busy person. How can I possibly fit this meditation? How can I possibly fit these spiritual practices that you're recommending into my very busy life? Well, of course I answer them when they ask that and they're a new person, I answer them very practically and I give them suggestions. Well, you can take a little time between your job and on meals and before you go to bed. I, I, I answer on that level. But if they're sensitive enough and willing to listen and hear what I might have to say, I might also say, it's not a matter of fitting your daily, your meditation into your daily life, into your spiritual life. It's a matter of, of, of or spitting your spiritual life into your daily activities. It's a matter of fitting your daily activities into your spiritual life, if you want to think of them as different. So consequently, for a person who begins to have a, a bit of an experience of God in your life, if you begin to have a sense, uh, a, a bit of a deepening in your, uh, in your meditation, and if you have a deepening, you feel great love when you're, when you're singing, you're naturally, that's what you're going to want to do uh, again, and you're want to, going to come back to it quickly. 
this is the state, this is what we want to attain in our life. It's very difficult to have that though, uh, unless you have some practical experience. In other words, you might say, it's difficult to love what you do not know. It's, if you keep the spiritual life, if you keep the concept of, of the divine as an abstraction, it'll be difficult. It's difficult to love an abstraction. This is the case of oftentimes people approach the spiritual life in terms of very gyanic principles and they like to talk about philosophy and, and so forth. But yet you often find that such people do not have the willpower, do they not have the enthusiasm to actually practice something. It's much better to have a very simple conception of the philosophy, to just keep it very, very basic and practice, rather than to have a very refined understanding, but you're not willing to do anything. Paramahansa or Swami Kriyananda often would use the example, and I used it in a webinar within the last couple of weeks and another one. He said, if you lived next to a very fine restaurant, perhaps a, one of the highest rated restaurants in the city, and you lived perhaps right above it or next to it, you would never go to it if you weren't hungry. You have to be hungry first. And if you are hungry, then naturally you'll follow and you'll go to visit that restaurant and you'll, and you'll eat. So the question of how do we deepen our spiritual life, how do we deepen our inner life, is a question again here of how do we deepen our devotion. Because it's devotion is going to be that which takes us and gives us the motivation to go deeper. We need the devotion. We need that desire to pursue the spiritual life. We need the desire to deepen. Then once we have the desire, then of course we need to do those things that are practical for us. Practice our Kriya, practice our meditation, practice the techniques, and then also put ourselves in the environment. But this, it, this um, topic begins with stimulating that devotion. What is devotion? It's the desire. It's really a desire. Now it's, it's often said in the scriptures that, or in the yogic practices, what we need to do is we need to overcome all desires. But this is the one desire that is good because the fulfillment, as it's said, all desires must one day be fulfilled. And we incarnate again and again until they are fulfilled. But this is the one desire that yes, we incarnate until it is fulfilled. But once it is fulfilled, all others disappear in, as you might think, in terms of a, of a river in flood. When that river is, in, is running slow, running small, in the, in the dry season, all along the edges of the river there might be uh, debris, branches, perhaps a little trash along the sides, paper bags and so on, plastic bags. But then when the river's in flood, monsoon comes, what happens? That river sweeps away all the debris along the edges of the riverbank. And this is how it is with us in our spiritual life. If we want to deepen our inner life, we have to summon up that energy, that devotion, that will sweep everything away in its path. Avoid any of those things that will dampen your devotion. One of the biggest obstacles for the devotee on the spiritual path is falling into those periods in your life when you don't care. I know all of us, at one time or another, we, life is a series of ups and downs on the spiritual, in our spiritual sadhana. Sometimes we're very devotional, other times we feel less so. When those times come, I often advise people, think of yourself as a sailor on a boat. You have a sail on the boat and 
when the sun is shining and the breeze is blowing, you lift that sail high and you make very good progress. But you know times will come when the breeze dies and the clouds come over and the storm comes. And then in those times you make very little progress. And what do you do at that time? Well, if you're a sailor and you're in the middle of the ocean, you're by yourself, small boat, you take your sail down maybe at those times and you hang on to the mast. And you just hang on. You tie yourself to the mast if you must. And then the storm passes and you ride with the storm. You don't fight it. You ride with it. You hang on and you know that what will happen, a few days go by, the clouds part, the sun comes out, the breeze comes again, and then you raise your sail again. This is, this is the, the devotee. This is how he handles adversity in life. It's going to come. Don't feel disappointed when tests and trials come. And if, it's, if, it's, if you find those opportunities when you can make progress, fine. But if you can't, just hang on. Don't despair. The sun will come out again. But what we want to avoid is those times when we find ourselves falling into a state of spiritual indifference. Paramahansa Yogananda said that this quality of not caring is perhaps the most difficult and the most dangerous of spiritual adversaries. Because with, when we're indifferent, we don't care about something, we, uh, you might say, the light has gone out. He, it's very similar to something he said about the quality of hope. He said hope is a very, one of the very important qualities for all of us to have. It's because, because when, or to cultivate, it's something that we cultivate. He says when we no longer have hope, we come to a halt on our spiritual life. Because it's hope is that light that shines in the darkness, just as a person walking in a very dark night cannot find its, uh, his way, he has a light. And that light shines and illuminates the path and helps him find his way. This is hope. Hope is that light shining in the darkness. And as long as it's lit, it, we walk the path to wherever the destination is. But when that hope is extinguished, it's dark. He says, the devotee then comes to a stop and will stop and wait until that light of hope is kindled again. And this may take a lifetime. Who knows? Maybe another lifetime. So always keep hope and never ever extinguish the light of hope in another person. He said it's a spiritual sin to discourage another person on their spiritual path. And how often it is sometimes we find ourselves discouraging others inadvertently things little things in uh, in that we say little things that we do we we must remember that we're we're in the company of other people when they're in, we're in the company of other devotees always to be, try to be an influence for upliftment try to be somebody who gives hope to other people to gives encouragement to other people there's a uh, bad habit, you might say, that uh, some of us have. It comes from, it just, it somewhat comes naturally because we all like humor, but sometimes uh, humor can be dangerous in this sense that if it's discouraging to other people. So never allow your humor to take that form and never allow your words to be, uh, take, uh, to be an influence in other people, to slow them down in your spiritual life. But for yourself as well is do those things that encourage you. Oftentimes, the hardest critic uh, about our, uh, to another person, or the hardest critic about to us, is ourselves. Is we're sometimes very, very critical. We, you could say it's a, uh, just like Swami Sri Yukteswar was talking about, one of the meanness of the heart being shame. Sometimes we're very ashamed of ourselves. We do something wrong, and we are not able to let it go and it hangs on to us. If we want to deepen our inner life, we have to let go of the past. Swami Sri Yukteswar said, the past lives of all men are, are, are uh, 
are stained. Everything in the future will improve if we make the right spiritual effort now. So we have to learn from the past and then make progress and go into the future. So uh, in one of the uh, Swami Kriyananda used to, there's a saying in, in uh, English, uh, uh, forgive and forget, forget, forgive and forget the past. And we, we want to apply that to ourselves. We want to forgive the past but we don't want to forget the past because it's by remembering the mistakes that we made that we can then improve ourselves and we can learn the lesson of life. Go forward and learn the lesson, but don't allow it to uh, stop your progress. Nothing can stop your progress. So to review a little bit of what we spoken about today of how to deepen your inner life. I'd like to go over the three, just to conclude by going over the three principles. One, look at your environment. How can you, how can you deepen your life? By through the realization that each one of us is influenced. We are influenced. Whether we like it or not, we cannot help it. We take on the coloration of the light within which we're, that is being shined, uh, shown upon us. Swami Kriyananda used to tell the story that uh, a man went into a store to buy a new suit. And he said, I'd like a green suit. And the salesman said, no problem, brought out a, a, a white suit, put on the white, put it on, fit very nicely. He says, well, this, the customer said, well, this fits very nicely, I, I like it, but I asked for a green suit. Salesman says, no problem. Brings out a light with a green lamp and it shines a green light on the suit and says, see, now you have a green suit. Well, it's like that. We find ourselves in an environment with different lights are being sh shown upon us. Realize that and choose your environment. Choose, associate with people that share your spiritual principles. Uh, surround yourself with influences that will uplift you. That's the first principle. Realizing that we want to be uplifted. In upliftment, we will naturally have an expanded sense of consciousness. So do those things which will expand, make you feel a sense of enlargement, and naturally upliftment of energy, a movement of energy upward, will increase your awareness. The second is practice the techniques that have been given to us. Kriya Yoga, the Om technique, those things that turn our consciousness away from this world of matter through the senses, withdraw that life force, as Kriya is meant to do, withdraw that life force and direct your attention within. Practice. Don't think theoretically. Practice. And the third, very important principle, is develop the heart's natural love. Actually, perhaps that's not said quite correctly. Uncover or remove those things that are preventing us from developing the heart's natural love. Though I spoke of those meannesses of the heart, but anything that constricts us, be an influence, put your philosophy into action. Develop the heart through uh, magnanimity of feeling. And it will naturally, you'll begin to feel a sense of expansion as you begin to include other people in your sympathies. Paramahansa Yogananda described this as the social way to God realization. He said this is very important and all of us need to participate in this as well. The, the sense that including others, your friends and your families, in your sympathy, then expanding that sense of sympathy to include neighbors, those people that, are, that you associate with on, on a casual basis, include them too in your sympathies, and then continue to expand until ultimately everybody in your life 
whether you meet them or just or just hear of them, including them in your sympathies as well. This was a mark of the life of Swami Kriyananda. Everybody was his friend. And you could see this. People would naturally be attracted to him. He would be in a crowd of people and people would look at him and sometimes they would ask another, who is that man? I feel something from him. That he had that presence because he was a friend to all. And he often said, when people asked him, how is it possible to be a friend of everybody? How can you possibly include this person, that person, this person, all thinking of them as your friends? He said, I don't think of them personally as my friend. He says, what I do is, I, in terms of personality, he says, I try to see God in everyone. And this is what we want to do. Try to see the divine in everybody. Like uh, Swami Ramdas, who saw Ram in everything. Like uh, Ram Prasad, who saw Divine Mother in everything. Divine Mother, I see you everywhere. Blind eyes see you nowhere. This is the consciousness that we want to uh, imbue within ourselves. And if we do this, our sense of self grows, our energy, uh, our energy rises, our awareness begins to expand and day by day we'll feel experientially in our daily life and in our daily spiritual practices we'll feel a deepening of our inner life. Many blessings to you and it's been a joy to be able to share with you this week.